the tragic loss of Nodar Kumar Tashvili, a dedicated Georgian luge athlete, cast a somber shadow over the 2010 Winter Olympics in Whistler, British Columbia. On February 12, 2010, the very day the world's eyes were turning towards Canada for the splendor of the opening ceremony, Kumar Tashvili was engaged in a training run on the luge track, a critical preparation for athletes striving for Olympic glory. Tragically, this routine turned fatal when Kumar Tashvili suffered a high-speed crash that led to his untimely death. Kumar Tashvili's accident marked him as the fourth athlete to perish in the midst of preparing for Winter Olympic competition, a grim reminder of the inherent risks associated with high-performance sports. Beyond this, he became the eighth athlete in the history of the modern Olympic Games to lose his life as a direct result of participation in Olympic sport, whether through competition or practice at the event's designated venues. In October 1998, in Benachati, soccer was more than a game. It was a symbol of honor. The teams from Benachati and Basangana were tied at 1-1 when an extraordinary and tragic event occurred. A lightning strike of devastating precision struck the field, instantly killing all 11 players from Benachati. Over 30 spectators suffered injuries, yet the Basangana team remained unscathed amidst the unfolding chaos. The incident was shocking, stirring up whispers of curses and otherworldly forces. It would be eternally etched in the minds of those who witnessed it, becoming a tale of a cherished sport meeting a turn of fate that defies explanation. One of the most astonishing horse races of the last century occurred on June 4, 1923 at Belmont Park in New York, where an underdog named Sweet Kiss, ridden by jockey Frank Hayes, emerged victorious. The shock partly stemmed from Sweet Kiss's track record. It seems the horse faced odds of 20 to 1 in the Belmont race. Hayes was also an unlikely winner, being a stableman rather than a professional jockey and having never competed in a race before. The circumstances leading to Hayes riding Sweet Kiss remain a mystery, but he reportedly had to lose eight pounds within a day to qualify. On race day, Hayes jogged for hours without food or water to make weight. A photo exists of Sweet Kiss and Hayes mid-race, and it was after this moment, yet before the finish line, that Hayes succumbed to a fatal heart attack. When race officials approached to celebrate, Hayes fell from the saddle, deceased. Hayes uniquely holds the record for never losing a race and being the sole jockey known to have won posthumously. Following this event, Sweet Kiss was retired, as no jockey would mount it and it was rumored to have been nicknamed Sweet Kiss of Death. An examination of the mortality risks in sports events yields some rather startling results. For example, boxing records show approximately 46 deaths per 100,000 participants. Base jumping sees about 43 deaths in contrast to skydiving, which has a fatality rate of 1 per 100,000 jumps approximately 1,000 car racers die per 100,000 participants, while motorbike racing accounts for 100 deaths. Swimming, encompassing open water and endurance events, has a fatality rate of two per 100K participants, and scuba diving has three. Now, I'm not sure which category this would fall in, but the death of Peter Biaksang Zwala in October 2014 was a tragic and unfortunate demise. The 23-year-old midfielder for Bethlehem Venklang FC in India was celebrating a game-tying goal in the 62nd minute of a match with a somersault, which he tragically misjudged. He landed on his neck, collapsed on the field, and was immediately taken to the hospital. A CT scan revealed severe spinal cord damage. After five days, he sadly passed away. Raymond Johnson Chapman, an American baseball player, dedicated his entire career to playing shortstop for the Cleveland Indians. Tragically, he was struck in the head by a pitch from Carl Mays and succumbed to his injuries 12 hours later. Chapman remains the only player to have died as a direct result of an injury sustained in a major league game. His untimely death prompted the establishment of a rule mandating umpires to replace the ball when it gets dirty. Additionally, it spurred the prohibition of spitballs following the 1920 season and was a key example in advocating for the use of batting helmets although it would be more than 30 years before their use became mandatory. 
1992, the Winter and Summer Olympics were held in the same year for the last time. On the second to last day of the Olympics, 27-year-old Swiss speed skier Nicola Bocetai was practicing on a public slope in La Lachère, France for the finals. Bochetai, using slalom skis instead of his usual wider speed skis, was descending the slope at high speed with teammate Pierre-Yves Jorand. As they neared a hill, people below began to shout and signal for them to stop. It was too late. Bochetai crested the hill and collided with a snow groomer on the other side. What the hell was a snow groomer doing there? He suffered fatal internal injuries and died. The Swiss team maintained that the snow groomer was stationary and concealed behind the hill without its siren or flashing lights on, while other witnesses provided conflicting accounts saying it was grooming the hill at the time of this unfortunate accident. Bull riding is an extremely dangerous sport, with 20 catastrophic injuries per 100,000 riders. From 1989 to 2016, at least 21 professional bull riders died. In addition, to an unknown number of amateurs. Lane Frost, born into a rodeo family, was drawn to bull riding despite its dangers. By five, he was mimicking bull riding on the arm of a couch and later rode calves on his family's farm. After moving to Oklahoma, he trained with the legendary bull rider Freckles Brown. At 19, Lane joined the Professional Rodeo Cowboys Association and quickly became a circuit favorite, winning the world championship at 23 and competing in the 1988 Calgary Olympics, taking home bronze and leading the U.S. team to gold. However, tragedy was about to strike. During the 1989 Cheyenne Frontier Days, Lane perfectly rode a bull named Taken Care of Business for the required eight seconds. However, after dismounting, the bull unexpectedly gored him with its horn, a risk inherent to the sport as noted by fellow bull rider Cody Lambert. In bull riding, it's common to sustain minor injuries like nicks and bruises. Usually riders just stand up and later everyone shares a laugh and a pat on the back. That's how it appeared in Lane's case. I've witnessed far more severe accidents than what Lane experienced. However, TCB's horn had fractured some of Lane's ribs and pierced a vital artery. After rising and taking a few steps, Lane signaled for help and then collapsed into the mud. He passed away within minutes. The following year, Lane was posthumously honored with an induction into the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame. Five years after his passing, his life was celebrated in the film, Eight Seconds. Back in 1968, Bill Masterton was playing for the Minnesota North Stars when he suffered one of the most horrific on-ice injuries the NHL had ever seen. During a game, he was checked hard and fell backwards, cracking his skull on the ice. It was a gruesome sight, and here's what we know. Masterton suffered a severe internal brain injury during the first period of Minnesota's January 13, 1968, game against the Oakland Seals at the Met Center. He carried the puck up the ice at full speed, passing it off as two Seals defenders, Larry Cahan and Ron Harris, converged on him. Masterton was knocked backward in the resulting collision and landed on his head. Like most players of his era, he was not wearing a helmet. Referee Wally Harris compared the hit to an explosion, adding he was checked hard, but I'm sure it wasn't a dirty play. The force of the impact caused Masterton to bleed from his nose, ears, and mouth. The impact of the hit caused him to lose consciousness before he hit the ice. According to some accounts, he briefly came to and muttered, never again, never again, before passing back out. He received treatment on the ice and in the dressing room before being rushed to Fairview Southdale Hospital. His wife, Carol, who was watching the game from the stands, and Masterton's parents, who were listening to the game from their home in Winnipeg, rushed to his bedside at the hospital. He was attended to by two neurosurgeons and three other doctors. They soon concluded that the injury was too severe for surgery to be a viable option. Some 30 hours after his fall, on January 15th, Masterton died without ever regaining consciousness. At the dawn of the 20th century, American football fields were akin to battlegrounds. The collegiate sport attracted tens of thousands of fans, challenging professional baseball in popularity. However, early football was dangerously violent, characterized by a punishing, forceful game where the forward pass was prohibited and sheer power was necessary to advance the ball. 
players formed impenetrable walls with linked arms and rammed into opponents with unprotected heads. Group tackles often resulted in ball carriers being submerged under a massive heap of players. The sport was lethal. Forward passing didn't exist. There was no neutral zone to divide offense and defense, and a mere five yards were required for a first down, not ten. Teams collided with the chaos of a demolition derby where kicking and punching were allowed. As for protective gear like pads and helmets, they were non-existent. The Washington Post reported that from 1900 to October 1905, at least 45 football players died, with numerous others suffering broken backs, internal injuries, and serious concussions, and to many broken noses to list. However, with so many deaths and horrific injuries came public outcry, resulting in much needed changes to the game, eventually evolving into what we see today. In 1993, USA Boxing removed the prohibition on women in the ring, paving the way for many, including Layla Amaria Ali, Muhammad Ali's daughter, Mia St. John, and the controversial figure skater Tanya Harding to compete. Among the 2,200 women registered with USA Boxing in 2005 was Becky Zerlentes, who held a PhD in geography, a black belt in Goshen Jitsu, a brown belt in Taekwondo, and had competed in triathlons, synchronized swimming, and kickboxing. In addition to her athletic pursuits, she taught economics and swimming at a community college and was the Colorado Golden Gloves champion in 2002. On April 2, 2005, Zerlentes entered the ring to face Heather Schmitz in a Golden Gloves championship bout. Zerlentes had declared it her final match as USA Boxing prohibited competitors over the age of 34, which she was at the time. And both athletes had cleared the pre-fight medical exams and were equipped with standard headgear. During the second round, Schmitz landed a punch on Zerlenti's face, resulting in a nosebleed. Once the bleeding was controlled, the match resumed. In the third round, Schmitz struck Zerlentes on the left temple, knocking her down. Zerlentes lost consciousness and tragically passed away the following afternoon. The coroner discovered no vascular malformation or aneurysm that could have burst due to the impact. It was simply a tragic strike, one that Zerlentes had previously endured multiple times that resulted in a blood vessel rupture. She became the first woman to succumb to an injury at a sanctioned amateur boxing event.